Tonight's presentation is brought to you by Gibson Guitar, the Coca-Cola Company, the Iridium Jazz Club in New York City, Best Buy, and Hard Rock. There are millions and millions of people that know they think Les Paul's a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Waukesha, Wisconsin. Waukesha, Wisconsin. Birthplace of Les Paul. This was my first act. I went in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I went on the stage. Yeah, I had the wig and the makeup and everything. Well, you have to start from somewhere. Just because you think you're so pretty, just because you think you're so hot, I was just a young guy that you couldn't hold him back. I was a racehorse. I switched from country music to jazz. Way back when I was a kid, my mother would say to me, Lester, you don't know how good that sounds. And I said, that's right. So I built a little studio in my apartment. I had a machine like this. With those crude recordings, I ended up learning to play the guitar and at the same time, a recording engineer. You go out and get some trumpets, you go out and get some violins, you can do anything. But I don't want the same sounds. I want sounds that have never been heard on Earth. I want new sound. How did he do it? How do you do that? It revolutionized the business. We were all trying to figure out how we did it and how we were going to be able to accomplish things like that. It's like a, a big guitar orchestra. It's like a big band. That's the machine I thought of for sound on sound. That's the one that Ben Crosby brought in, in the back of his car. I says, hey, I need another record head. We mounted the head in there. And I said, Mary, say something. Hello. Hi, hello, hello. there. Hello. Hi, hello there. Both parts are on the tape. I had the first sound on sound tape machine. <laughs> anywhere. A garage, a basement, a motel, I can do a film station. This is what we made How High the Moon on, Mockingbird Hill, Meet Mr. Callahan. Hit after hit after hit. There was a boy, a very strange enchanted boy. They say he wandered very far, very far over land and sea. A little shy and sad of eyes. But very wise was he. And then one day, one magic day, he passed my way. And as we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is to love and be loved in return.
And then one day, one magic day, he passed my way. And as we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is to love and be loved in Good evening. Please welcome to the stage the president of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum, Mr. Terry Stewart. That's Paul Trio. Now, you all know that this gentleman's been a leading guitarist in the whole world the last four decades, and with his number one albums and his hit singles, he's ruled the world with things like uh, Living in the USA, Jetliner, Abracadabra. Swingtown, The Joker, Rocking Me, Take the Money and Run, Fly Like an Eagle, and the list goes on. But what's, what's really interesting is that his musical legacy started at a very early age, and uh, very few people know that uh, he was Les Paul's godson. And uh, can you just take a little bit in uh, time and tell the folks about that? Well, uh, yeah, Les was my godfather, and um, I was four and a half when... Uh, I met Les, and Les Paul and Mary Ford came to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where uh, my family lived, to put their act together at a nightclub called Jimmy Fazio's Supper Club, and they, they were going to play there about six weeks, work the act out, and then they were going to take it to New York and start their television show. And uh, my father, who was a doctor, was also a tape recorder nut, and he had a... Uh, a very good tape recorder, and he went over and he introduced himself to Les Paul, and he said, I've got this fine tape recorder, I'd like to come down and record you. And Les said, yeah, that'd be great. So every night, my dad would take me with him into this nightclub, and I would go watch Les Paul and Mary Ford play. And every show was sold out. Uh, my dad would record every show, so I have all these tape recordings of Les and Mary from 1949 and 1950. And they were, you know, working on their act. And um, I looked at him and I just went, man, I want to do that. That looks like so much fun. And uh, he was funny. You know, I remember one night when... Uh, Tal Farlow, a great jazz guitar player, came into the club, and wherever Les played, the show was always sold out, and there were always five great guitar players just to see what he was doing next. He was so hot. And Les was, he was 30 years old, I guess. You know, he was a kid. He was just ripping this solo up, you know, just da -da 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 you know, and Tal Farlow walked in, and everybody went, it's Tal Farlow has come into the club, and Les reached into his pocket without missing a beat, put a handkerchief over his left hand and continued to play so Tal couldn't steal his licks. <laughs> I went, I want to do that when I grow up. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it just started like that. And he taught me how to hold a guitar. He taught me my first chords. Uh, I was uh, really, I loved uh, the idea of show business. And I was just this little kid making up songs and banging on my uncle's guitar. I was in the third floor doing my show for the neighborhood kids, you know, yelling down into the alley, hey, who wants to hear a love song? Who wants to, you know, and I'd make something up. And my dad snuck in and recorded me doing this. And then when Les Paul came over to the house, he played it for Les Paul. And I was furious. I just, God, how could you do that to me, you know? And Les paid me to listen to the tape. He told me I was, you know, I told him I was so embarrassed I couldn't stand the way my voice sounded on, on this tape machine. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, he said, we all feel like that. And 
There's no need to be embarrassed. And you're really going to go places, Steve. And I believed him. You know, he, he, he started, you know. And uh, I could tell you many, 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 many more great stories about Les Paul. There are a lot of people here tonight who are going to sing and play for his memory. But I, I will just tell you this, that I loved him very much. He moved the uh, recording industry forward farther than anybody else in the 20th century. He was a giant. He had the biggest heart of any musician I ever knew. He taught me how to share my spotlight and my stage with, with all the musicians that, that play with me. And he's always been that way. And, and any time you would go to see Les Paul, there might be Tony Bennett sitting over here and Johnny Rotten sitting over there, and he'd go, Johnny, come on up here. What do you got? You know, I mean, he was, he was open to everybody. So when you see the cast of characters that are going to come across this stage tonight and testify for less, you'll get the picture of what really a broad consensus is. He was a, a wide-open human being who loved everybody, and he really gave it up. And rest in peace, Les. Thank you for everything. Love you so much. Thank you. Steve will be back later with the Les Paul Trio. One more time, Steve Miller, please. I'm one of the lucky ones like you tonight. I'm Terry Stewart. I'm from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the museum in Cleveland, Ohio. And it's a thrill to be here to celebrate the life and legacy of such a giant as Les Paul. And in the museum in Cleveland, you will see one of our most outstanding permanent exhibits traces the musical legacy of this man. But tonight, I'm here to welcome you to the Les Paul Tribute at the, at the legendary Ryan Auditorium, where for the next couple of hours, as Steve suggested, you're going to see and hear from countless musicians who were inspired and influenced by Les. His music, his guitar, and the incredible advances he made in audio recording. For those of you who are never lucky enough to make it to the Iridium or Fat Tuesdays over the 25 plus years that he was in residency there in New York City, tonight you'll get a glimpse of that weekly experience of musicians just showing up to sit in with Les Paul and the Les Paul Trio. We're going to start off though, I want to introduce to you a good friend, a member of my board of directors in Cleveland, the chairman and CEO of Gibson Guitar, home of the Les Paul Guitar. Mr. Henry Josquitz, please give him a round of applause. Uh, as Steve suggested, again, Henry and I and others up here who were lucky enough to know Les could spend the whole night telling stories uh, and, and repeating jokes that we know, but we thought we'd spend a few minutes and reminisce uh, just about some of the things that we saw and touched and, and heard that we were lucky enough to be a part of. Well, I guess I'll start with the first time I, I met Les. Uh, I had talked to him a couple of times on the telephone, and uh, he was not real happy with the company before uh, I got involved, and he was a little cynical about myself. Uh, so he invited me down to Fat Tuesdays in New York, where he was playing at the time. And I'd never met him personally, and I was guitar player, I was really excited, legendary guy, and uh, so I got in and there was a long line, you know, and uh, finally I got seated sort of in the back corner, and uh, Les was playing uh, marvelously, and all, all, during one of the songs he flipped a toggle switch on his Les Paul, and the toggle switch popped out. He looks at the guitar, looks around, stands up. He says, you know, I understand the guy who owns Gibson <laughs> is here, and he's the guy who made this guitar. <laughs> I'd like him to stand up and be recognized. And I did, and uh, I've, I really played less as straight man ever since. That's the way the relationship started. And uh, Les has this really marvelous sense of humor and uh, sense of humanity. And you know, we'll 
uh, talk about his uh, innovation and inventiveness and uh, musicianship. Uh, but what I remember most is the bright, glaring blue eyes that were so full of life, even in, the, in his last years. And he, he just had this life in him. And it was, it was so obvious. And um, he had this rich resource. And, um, but he was a, a pretty funny guy. Les was um, always going to give a lot of his material, or all of it, to the Smithsonian. And he started coming to the Cleveland Clinic about, I guess, almost 40 years ago. He, got, he had one of their first bypasses there. And our chief curator started trying to talk to him about material and getting an exhibit. He said, no, Jim Hinkey, uh, all this is going to the Smithsonian. And one day, Les finally came through the museum, walked around, and afterwards he said, Jim, I get it. My stuff's got, got to come here. And Jim said, why? He said, well, you know, I just realized if I send us stuff all down the Smithsonian, they'll take one guitar hanging next to Judy Garland's red slippers, and that'll be the last thing anybody ever saw of me. You know, <laughs> he, he, I mean, over and over again, last year when we, um, when we had this tribute to him, we put him in the presidential suite at the Ritz. And you got to remember, Les was hip to the tip, as Jerry Wexler would say, right, right to his last day. And he walks into the presidential suite, he looks around, and he goes, so this is how I roll in Cleveland. I mean, it's <laughs> over and over and over again. I mean, I'm seriously, the, he, he, we did a whole day symposium with him in Cleveland. And one of my favorite stories, is he talked about having all the hits in the early 50s. And uh, one of his colleagues was Miles Davis. He knew Miles quite well. He, was, he loved jazz. And Miles walked up to Les and said, you know, you and Mary, you have all these hits. I've got to have a hit. I'm starving to death. What do I do? Les said, play the melody. Yeah, well, you know, Les played uh, every Monday night for, for decades. And so I asked Les, uh, why do you do that, Les? You don't have to do that. And uh, he wasn't making a lot of money doing that, and he was a very affluent guy at the time, and uh, he said, well, uh, when I had a illness and went to the Cleveland Clinic, uh, I got one of the first heart bypasses ever done, and I just, it saved my life, I was so grateful, uh, I asked the doctor, is there anything I can do for you, doctor, you saved my life, uh, eternally grateful. And the doctor told him, he said, Les, I want to make sure you keep playing. I want you to promise me you're going to play uh, for the rest of your life. And, and he took that very seriously. And that was uh, one of the things that motivated him uh, to play every Monday night. Now we, uh, we will tell more of these stories. And I'm going to crank these folks up here in the trio to get them to share a little bit of that humor, too. But, uh, you know, Les Paul had quite a history with country music, Nashville and the Ryman. In 1955, right here in this auditorium, Les and Mary made a guest appearance on the very first televised episode of the Grand Ole Opry uh, when the show became a regular national TV on ABC. Les then later on made a top ten appearance in the country charts with his big hit Mockingbird Hill. And, of course, we all know that Les and Chet Atkins had a Grammy award-winning album at Lester and Chester in 1977. So. Right now, in that vein, please welcome to the stage Nashville's own, by way of Canada, Grammy Award nominated Emerson Drive. It's an honor to be here in the Ryman tonight. We've, uh, we've done the Opry quite a few times over the last uh, 10 years, and every time you get a chance to play back here is something special. Uh, and we don't have uh, too many uh, stories about Les because we never had a chance to meet him. Um, I guess the one thing we can say for a bunch of young guys like us that uh, get to reap the rewards of uh, a legend uh, who has uh, built something over time, and, and now guys like us get to play um, 
you know, the guitars that uh, that'll last forever. And uh, just last week, we actually uh, took uh, one of the songs off the new album back in the studio and uh, and put that Les Paul on it and uh, completely uh, changed the song for, for the better. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, listening to the music tonight and thank you to Gibson for uh, for having us here. And uh, this is a song that we uh, just redid this past week and uh, it's off the new album. This is called The Extra Mile. very much. Enjoy the evening. Thank you once again for being here tonight. Emerson Drive. One more time, please. Emerson Drive. Thank you. You're going to love it. We have a nice long night of so many artists to come out here and it's an honor to be able to introduce all of them. Next up is a legendary 
singer, songwriter, J.D. Souther. Yeah. J.D.'s penned songs for Linda Rodstead, James Taylor, Jackson Brown. He co-wrote some of the biggest hits for the Eagles, including Best of My Love, <laughs> Victim of Love, Heartache Tonight, New Kid in Town. Now here he is with the Les Paul Trio, Lou Paolo on guitar, John Coliani on piano, Nikki Parat on bass, J.D. Souther. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, of course, it's an honor to be here. I'll, I'll just uh, tell you a, uh, a quick story because it's gonna, you're going to be here till midnight listening to everybody reminisce about this wonderful guy. My connection with Les Paul is through my dad. They were contemporaries. My dad died two years ago at 92. Les Paul. They knew each other uh, from uh, long ago. My dad was a big band singer in the 40s and knew Les and Mary. And he booked them. Uh, later, he was a booker for... Uh, CMA, I think, and, um, and worked with him with some dates there. But I remember him bringing me a record of How High the Moon and saying, uh, these people did all this at home, just two of them. And I just said, what? What do you mean? <laughs> and the, the multi-tracking was phenomenal. The musicianship was phenomenal. Mary was great. Les is, uh, was uh, and is still a miracle of guitar playing and sort of the standard by which everybody's judged. It's like, it's often said that if you're not playing uh, what Les is playing, you're playing it wrong. And that's pretty much true. I don't play that well, but I know he liked this tune, so I'm gonna do it with this fabulous band with John and Lou and uh, Nikki. It's called Bye Bye Blackbird. Pack up all my cares and woes, here I go, singing low, bye-bye, blackbird. Where somebody waits for me, sugar sweet. Swing low, bye 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 bye. Where somebody waits for me, sugar sweet, so she. Bye 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 bye.
John. Thank you very much. Thanks, you guys. Good night. J.D. Souther. Les Paul Trio. John, Lou, Ricky. They'll be back. They're going to come back. As I said, we're going to see so many great stars up here tonight. Um, next up, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, Steve Cropper. <laughs> Guitarist for Booker T and the MGs. Played on hundreds of recordings by Stax artists such as Otis Redding, Sam and Dave, Johnny Taylor, many, many more. Also acted as producer and songwriter on many of those songs. If you don't remember including his list of compositions, you've got little tunes like Soul Man, Setting on the Dock of the Bay, Knock on Wood, In the Midnight Hour, some of the most memorable records of all time, and you might even remember him from a couple of motion pictures that we all saw called the Blues Brothers. Please, Hall of Fame inductee Steve Cropper.
unfortunately, I never got to really play with him because I never could learn to play that fast. <laughs> so I picked a ballad off of one of his early albums with Mary. And uh, it's a great song, Summertime. There's still room for some summertime. So without further ado, let's watch what a few other people have to say about the great list. <laughs> 